Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, and your host here on Last Week in the Church, the show where we harvest the fruits of the last week in journalism on the Vatican and the global Catholic Church. I hope wherever you are, you are surviving the heat because, man, it is hot. And I say this from Rome, where we are in, like, I don't know, like our 20th consecutive day of red alerts for heat. And it's not getting any better today. It's supposed to be 108 degrees here in Rome. But just as the temperature outside is sizzling, so is the temperature in Vatican journalism. Here's what we've got for you this week. We begin with the sense of sovereignty, how recent events have offered us almost accidentally a reminder of why the Vatican is so tenacious in its defense of the sovereignty of the Holy See. Then, we shift to of diplomacy and demographics, how the basically demographic shifts on both sides of the relationship between the Vatican and Israel are redefining this all-important diplomatic relationship. Third, we've got the passing of a prophet, how the death of Italian Bishop Luigi Bezzati at the age of 99, just a few days shy of 100 years old, marks, in effect, the end of an era, but an era that anticipated the Francis papacy. We are going to break all that down for you. Fourth, a quiet mission. How the Pope's top diplomat recently took a visit to Azerbaijan and Armenia to carry out a kind of below-the-radar sotto voce peace mission. We'll try to explain what was going on there. And then finally, a deal within the deal? The Vatican has signed off on a Chinese transfer of a new bishop to Shanghai, which technically violated the terms of a 2018 agreement between Beijing and Rome. But there is a suggestion that there might be some horse trading going on behind the scenes. We'll try to explain what's going on there as well. All that and more is waiting for you this week on Last Week in the Church. So please, stay where you are. Go nowhere. Don't do anything. Don't change the channel. Don't even get a drink. Don't go to the bathroom. Because we're going to be right back. And it's true confessions time. I'm going to admit to you that when it comes to 21st century high technology, I'm not really your guy. I mean, to be honest with you, I think social media is basically a work of the devil. And I'm not entirely kidding about that. I don't have accounts on Instagram or TikTok or LinkedIn or any of these other things that you're supposed to have. And I don't even know what any of those things mean. When it comes to artificial intelligence, I don't really get what the buzz is about because, frankly, whatever intelligence I possess has been artificial for a very long time. However, I like to think that what I lack in tech savvy, I can make up for in judgments about people. And so when people I respect, people I admire, people I trust, tell me that a particular piece of technology is valuable, I listen to them. And that brings us, by a roundabout fashion, to a new technological platform called Magisterium AI that has been launched by our friends at Longbeard. Longbeard is a digital strategy and design company. They are the backbone of the technological dimension of Crux. Basically speaking, everything about how the Crux site operates, everything you see, when you come to the Crux site is because of them. Frankly, my show last week in the church is because of them. The CEO of Longbeard, Matthew Sanders, once came to me and said, you know, I think we could do something with a weekly video and podcast. And I was dumb enough to listen to him, and here we are. Now, Longbeard has put out this new tool which harnesses the power of artificial intelligence to the magisterium of the Catholic Church. So you can go on their site and type in, what does the Catholic Church teach on abortion? Or why do we have to go to Mass? Or could you please write a homily for me for the Feast of Christ the King? Whatever. And based upon this tool's exposure to official documents of the Catholic Church, it will spit out a response. And it will also give you citations. So if you want to check to make sure that it's legit, 
you'll have the tools to do that. It is one of the more creative, useful, hopeful, and I think positive applications of AI technology in the Catholic sphere anyone to date has come up with. So I encourage you to check it out. You can find it online at magisterium.tech. Again, that is magisterium.tech. Look, like I say, I am not a tech guy, but even I would use this tool, and I promise you, if I'm open to it, if I see some value to it, then that special Luddite in your life will too. Check it out, Magisterium AI. All right, everybody, happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, July 18th in the year of our Lord, 2023. The forecasts here in Rome are that today is going to be a record high temperature. We're supposed to hit 108 degrees Fahrenheit. Hopefully, the forecasts add that that's going to feel like 109. Frankly, I don't really know what the difference between 109 and 108 feels like, but I can tell you it feels hot. And as hot as I am, I can promise you that our two pugs, Augusto and Gelsamina, and you know, pugs have this like flat face, right? They can't actually breathe and they tend to overheat anyway under the best of circumstances. This is a terrible, terrible moment for them. But despite all of that, as hot as it may be on the streets of Rome and in other parts of the world, it is even hotter on the Vatican beat because this is the Pope Francis era. We have no breaks. We have no downtime. There is no vacation. We are always on the job. And so here's what we've got for you this week. We begin with the sense of sovereignty. So recently, Italian Cardinal Matteo Zuppi, who is the Cardinal of Bologna, he is the president of the Italian Bishops' Conference, also a product of the community of San Egidio, one of the new movements in the Catholic Church to come out of the Second Vatican Council, long dedicated to conflict resolution and ecumenical and interfaith dialogue. Zuppi was designated by Pope Francis as his special envoy for peace in Ukraine. So in June, he made trips at the beginning of the month to Kiev, where he met, among others, President Vladimir Zelensky and other leading officials of the government in Ukraine. And then at the end of the month, he traveled to Moscow, where he was not able to meet President Vladimir Putin or the foreign minister of Russia. He did meet a special presidential advisor on foreign policy, but he was also able to meet Patriarch Kirill, head of the Russian Orthodox Church and other leading clerics in the Russian Orthodox world. Now, here's why all of this is of lasting interest. You know, the Vatican, as you well know, and really when I use the word Vatican, I am misspeaking because the actual term I should be using is the Holy See. The Holy See is the term for the government of the Catholic Church as a sovereign entity in international law. It is, boy, what to call it, a rara avis, something sui generis, you know, a kind of unique creature in international law. It is a non-physical sovereign entity that is recognized by virtually the entire international community. The Holy See currently has diplomatic relations with 184 states and international entities. Bear in mind, the United Nations only recognizes 193 countries, so that means the vast majority of countries on the face of the earth recognize the Holy See as a sovereign entity with which they wish to have diplomatic relations. Now, you know, every now and then, somebody comes along to challenge that, right? In 2007, the prestigious international journal, The Economist, carried a piece on Vatican diplomacy, the conclusion of which was, you know, guys, come on, this sovereign thing is kind of a, what? convenient fiction. They say, you know, you could just renounce all that and become what you truly are, which is one of the world's biggest non-governmental organizations, an NGO. The Vatican, to put it politely, did not respond well 
to that suggestion. Then Foreign Minister of the Vatican, French Archbishop Dominique Mamberti, responded with a one-line <laughs> comment, which is, this is not an acceptable suggestion. And that tracks what the Vatican has always said whenever anybody comes along to question its sovereign status. You know, I mean, Catholics for Choice, which is a group based in the United States that advocates for abortion rights and other positions at odds with Catholic teaching, has launched something called the Sea Change Campaign, trying to get the Vatican stripped of its sovereign status. Every now and then, there will be a government that decides to downgrade its embassy to the Vatican or to try to combine it with their embassy to Italy. The Vatican always puts up a kind of full frontal resistance to that. Now, look. I get it. It is easy to say that Vatican sovereignty is a kind of, what, a vestigial reminder of the era in which the Pope was also a monarch over a swath of territory in central Italy called the Papal States. You can object that the Vatican uses its sovereignty to insulate itself from accountability in civil courts, for instance in lawsuits related to the clerical sexual abuse scandals in the United States and elsewhere. But here's the thing. We've got a reminder recently of why the Vatican defends its sovereignty so tenaciously. In the meeting that Cardinal Zuppi had with Patriarch Kirill in Moscow on June 29th, not coincidentally, that was the great Roman feast of Saints Peter and Paul. So here's the thing. Zuppi entered that meaning as the representative of a pope who has his own unique line on the war in Ukraine, right? I mean, Pope Francis certainly is not part of the Western axis, you know? I mean, he doesn't want to arm Ukraine to the teeth. He's actually condemned the flow of Western arms into Ukraine. He's called for a negotiated peace, but he's also not in the pocket of the Kremlin or Putin I mean, he hasn't referred to Ukraine as part of the historical territory of Russia. He hasn't called the Ukrainian leadership Nazis, you know, all of which is part and parcel of the Russian rhetoric about this war. You can agree or disagree with the Pope's line, but it is indisputably his own that is not beholden to any other state or power, right? You certainly can't say the same thing about Patriarch Kirill. I mean, bear in mind, that just days before he sat down with Zupi, Kirill and the leadership of the Russian Orthodox Church had compactly stood behind Putin during the brief-lived uprising of the Wagner Group mercenaries. I mean, basically speaking, the Russian Orthodox Church is, in terms of perception, okay, it is seen as a wholly owned subsidiary of the Kremlin. It is a reliable ally and partner of Putin and the Kremlin powers. Why? Because it's not sovereign. It has no concept of independence. It sees itself as the spiritual arm of the authority of the Russian state. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why the Vatican over the centuries has been so determined in the defense of its own sovereignty. Because what's the alternative? The alternative is the Vatican, like the Russian Orthodox Church or other churches and religious organizations around the world, would become subordinate to some instrument of political power. In other words, you may not like Vatican sovereignty, but what I'm asking you to consider is, would you like the alternative more? You know, I doubt it, is the honest answer to that question. All right, we move on. So, of demographics and diplomacy. This week, for the first time in 12 years, an Israeli foreign minister in the person of Minister Ailey Cohen came calling in the Vatican. He had a meeting with British Archbishop Paul Gallagher, who is the Vatican's foreign minister. And this was widely hailed as an attempt to get Israeli-Vatican relations back on track. Now, the thing is, it's a little difficult not to notice that this meeting came at a time when Israeli-Vatican relations may be at their lowest ebb in a very long time. Twelve years ago, okay, the last time an Israeli foreign minister came to the Vatican, the big issue was whether or not Israel and the Vatican would be able to come to terms 
on an economic agreement to stabilize the tax and fiscal status of church-owned properties in the Holy Land that was envisioned as a follow-up to the fundamental agreement that was signed between Israel and the Vatican in 1993. We are, by the way, observing the 30th anniversary of that agreement this year. You know what the big issue today was when the Israeli foreign minister came? It was whether Christians, including, by the way, the Latin Rite Patriarch of Jerusalem, ought to be able to walk down the streets of Jerusalem without being sped upon. Because there has actually been a wave of physical harassment and abuse directed at Christians in Jerusalem by elements, ultra-Orthodox elements of Israeli society, emboldened by the fact that the ultra-Orthodox are now represented in the government of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, Foreign Minister Ailey Cohen condemned those attacks during his meeting with Archbishop Gallagher, but note, it was the first time he'd actually done so, despite the fact that these attacks have been going on for months. Now, look, what does all this tell us? What it tells us is that relationships between Israel and the Vatican have fallen upon hard times. Why is that? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that a large part of it is demographics on both sides of the relationship. On the Israeli side, you have the growing footprint of the ultra-Orthodox in Israeli society. They are the most rapidly growing element of Israeli society. And today, they account for 32 seats in the 120-member Israeli Knesset, its parliament. I mean, in other words, you can't ignore them. And the ultra-Orthodox, generally speaking, have not been part of the growth in Catholic-Jewish dialogue since the Second Vatican Council. On the Catholic side, you have the fact that increasingly the center of gravity in the Catholic Church is not in the global north. It is not in Europe and North America, where Catholic-Jewish relations were pioneered after the Second World War and the Second Vatican Council. It's in the global south. It is in Africa and Latin America and Asia where, frankly, Catholic leaders don't have a great lived experience of interaction with Judaism and where, for them, higher priorities in terms of interfaith relations tend to be Islam in much of the world. In India, certainly, it is Hinduism. In other parts of the world, it is Buddhism. But it just, frankly, is not Judaism. And without conflating, the diplomatic relationship between the Vatican and Israel and the religious relationship between the Catholic Church and Judaism, the fact is Catholic prelates who don't see Catholic Jewish relations as a priority probably aren't also going to see Vatican-Israel relations as a priority. Now, none of this is to say the relationship can't be saved. It certainly can. But the point is that natural momentum is not going to carry us to a better place. If progress is going to be made, it's going to have to be intentional on both sides. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the point, or, you know, if I can channel my inner Sean Connery from the Untouchables, here endeth the lesson. All right, third up this week, we have the passing of a prophet. So this past Sunday, at the ripe old age of 99 years, Italian Bishop Luigi Batazzi went to his reward. Batazzi was the last surviving Catholic bishop who signed the so-called Pact of the Catacombs at the Second Vatican Council. This was an agreement at the very end of Vatican II that 42 bishops signed basically saying, we want to renounce wealth and privilege. We want to embrace the idea of a poor church. And so we're not going to own property ourselves. We're going to reject titles such as your eminence or your excellency. We just want to be called father. We're going to live the life of an ordinary member of the faithful. So it was 42 bishops at Vatican II who signed this. Eventually, more than 500 around the world put their name on it. In Italy, Batazzi is also known as a bishop who, in 1976, published an open letter to the then head of the Italian Communist Party, a guy by the name of Enrico Berlinguer, essentially saying, I want to have a dialogue with you. 
I want to open a relationship with you. Bear in mind, at the time, an edict issued by the Vatican in 1949, excommunicating any Catholic who joined the Communist Party, who voted for the Communists, who read Communist literature, who had anything to do with the Communists. That edict of excommunication was still technically in force, but Batazzi said he was thinking of all those Catholics in Italy who maybe had voted for the communists but didn't want to renounce their religious faith. They just wanted to build a more just society. And he said a society, by definition, that is more just is also more Christian. He was a rebel and a prophet until the very end. I mean, in 2007, Batazzi came out in favor of civil unions for same-sex couples. And in 2015, he signaled he would actually be open to marriage rights for same-sex couples. Now, here's the thing. Batazzi, you know, make of him what you will, right? I mean, some people thought of him as a courageous prophet. Other people thought of him as a kind of naive who, you know, basically went too far in terms of accommodating people who were hostile to the church on a variety of fronts. But he was one of those guys who kind of kept the church alive. Do you all remember the famous play in the movie Mass Appeal, where the Jack Lemmon character says of his young priest, who's kind of a, you know, a little bit of a Batazzi figure, says of him, you are a lunatic but you're one of those lunatics that keeps the church alive, right? Batazzi was one of those guys, right? And the truth of it is, without him, the Catholic Church is simply going to be a little bit more gray, a little bit more dull, a little bit less interesting. I would note also that with his death, there are only four bishops left alive who participated in the Second Vatican Council, the youngest, Cardinal Francis Orenze of Nigeria is actually 90 years old. So anybody interested in an oral history project of Vatican II, here's my warning, your opportunities to interview people who actually participated, at least among the episcopacy, they're starting to run out. You know, now would be the time. All right, fourth up this week, a quiet mission. So the Pope's top diplomat, actually his top aide of any sort, is Italian Cardinal Pietro Paterlin. Now, this summer, the most celebrated, the most notorious, the most talked about peace mission of the Vatican was the mission of Cardinal Zuppi, we've already discussed, to Ukraine and Russia, trying to open lines of communication that might lead to some negotiated settlement of the Ukraine conflict, at least in the interim, might lead to some humanitarian measures. But that doesn't mean the Vatican is ignoring other parts of the world. And this past week, quietly, without much fanfare, without any previous announcement, Cardinal Pietro Perlin traveled to both Azerbaijan and Armenia, two nations admittedly small in the Caucasus that nevertheless have been at loggerheads for a long time, to try to promote a new cycle of dialogue and conflict resolution there. Now, the dispute between Azerbaijan and Armenia concerns a territory called Nagorno-Karabakh. It is a territory that falls within the borders of Armenia, but where never the, of, sorry, of Azerbaijan, but where nevertheless the majority of the population is Armenian. And so Armenia wants to claim it. Azerbaijan wants to claim it. They actually went to war in the 90s over this territory, and it remains a sore spot between the two countries. So Paterlin first went to Azerbaijan, where he met with the president of the country and other civic officials to try to promote a spirit of dialogue and peaceful resolution of the conflict. He then went to Armenia and basically did the same thing, met with the president and civic leaders in Armenia, also religious leaders, and again, always in a spirit of trying to promote a climate of dialogue and peaceful resolution of conflict. Now, here's what makes all this interesting. 
Externally, you could say, what the hell is the Vatican doing there? Like, because Azerbaijan is a majority Shia Muslim state, okay? Armenia, meanwhile, is an overwhelmingly Christian society. It actually was the first officially Christian state in the world. It was 301 AD that Armenia declared itself a Christian state. That was 12 years before the celebrated Edict of Milan in which the Emperor Constantine did not, by the way, as some people think, make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. He simply declared tolerance of Christianity in the Roman Empire. So, you know, from a certain point of view, you would think, how could the Vatican position itself as a fair arbiter in this conflict when its sympathies, confessionally, you know, should lie with Christian Armenia rather than Shia Azerbaijan. Well, the truth of it is that since the Second Vatican Council, a series of popes have made a point of reaching out to the Islamic world, and in particular, the Shia branch of Islam, with which Catholicism has some natural affinities. And so the Vatican has been able to convince both sides in this conflict that it has their best interests at heart. Now, it's not as if this trip by Paraline produced a magic wand that made the tensions between Azerbaijan and Armenia go away. It was, however, a small reminder that the Vatican's ability to position itself as a neutral voice of conscience on the global stage, including neutrality, even between Christianity and others among the world's great religions, that is a kind of unique and precious asset that the Vatican has been working to build for decades, if not for centuries. And to the extent that Azerbaijan and Armenia are able to find some kind of common ground over their conflict, it will be due in no small measure to the efforts of the Vatican, and that in itself has to say something about the benefit of having some entity on the global stage while inspired by Christian teachings that can nevertheless embrace the world. You know, as Pope Paul VI once said, we are experts in humanity. And in its own small, uncelebrated way, Paraline's trip to Azerbaijan and Armenia this past week make that point. Finally, this week, we have the deal within the deal. So, speaking of Cardinal Paraline, he also gave an interview this week to Vatican Media, that is the official media outlet of the Vatican, in which he said, that the Vatican had decided to sign off on the transfer of a bishop in China to the Diocese of Shanghai, even though that transfer had been made without the prior knowledge or consent of Pope Francis, which was, according to Paroline, a violation of the 2018 Provisional Accord negotiated between Beijing and Rome governing the appointment of Catholic bishops in China. Now, I had to add that according to Paroline, because the thing of it is, the terms of that 2018 provisional agreement have never been made public. We're five years into it, and we still don't actually know what it says, because neither the Chinese nor the Vatican have released the text of this agreement, even though they both act as if everybody knows what it says. But in any event, this is the second time in a 12-month period when the Chinese have done something which, according to the Vatican anyway, violated the deal. In November, they appointed a new bishop for a diocese which the Chinese government recognizes, but the Vatican does not. At that time, the Vatican issued a public protest basically saying, hey, you know, we didn't agree to this. What's going on? Flash forward to April of 2023, when the transfer to Shanghai was made, at that point, the Vatican didn't say anything. So this interview with Paroline is their first public comment. And basically what Paroline said is, okay, this transfer to Shanghai violates the terms of our agreement. We don't like that, but we're going to accept it anyway for the pastoral good 
of the Diocese of Shanghai, which has not had a bishop for the last 10 years and therefore clearly is in need of leadership. And Shanghai is a pivotal urban center in China, crucial to the future of the church in the country. And so Parlin basically said, we may not like it, but we're going to accept it. Now, at the same time, Parlin also said, you know what would really be helpful in the middle of all this is if we could establish some kind of like permanent office, clearinghouse office in China for dialogue between the Vatican and Beijing. Now, here's the thing. Beijing, remember we talked about diplomatic relations of the Vatican. China is one of the 12 countries on earth that does not have diplomatic relations with the Vatican. There is no right now current channel for communications. So basically what Perlin was hinting at here is, look, okay, we're going to accept this transfer to Shanghai. We might even accept future transfers that aren't exactly in accord with the terms of the deal, but in exchange, what we want is a down payment on future diplomatic relations in the form of a permanent beachhead for some kind of Vatican emissary in China to conduct conversations with the government. We don't want to rely on third parties. We want some kind of formal channel. We'll see how the Chinese respond to that, but this, ladies and gentlemen, is an object lesson in Vatican diplomacy, always thinking not just of the today, but also the tomorrow of these relationships and how they might play out over time. All right, as ever, you can find full coverage of all these stories on the Crux site, that is cruxnow.com. While you're there, if you can spare a moment to make a contribution to our GoFundMe campaign for our managing editor, Charlie Collins, who is struggling with a devastating illness, we would be very grateful. We will be back here next week, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week. Stay cool for the love of God, and we will talk to you again very soon.